Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackleford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Solidarity Now, the 1968 Poor People's Campaign, is open upstairs through the end of September. The traveling exhibit explores that pivotal grassroots movement and examines the six-week protest community that formed around it in Washington, D.C. And in conjunction with that exhibit, at 11 a.m. tomorrow, we'll have a gallery talk by our curator of collections, Megan Bankston, who will discuss the Mississippi artifacts on display and lead a tour. Remember also that faith-affiliated communities in Mississippi, groups who attend churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, house churches, and more, may now visit these museums free of charge in groups of 10 or more, thanks to a grant from the Lilly Endowment. You can stop by the ticket desk or check the museum's website or call the main number for details. Finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History is Lunch when Angela Stewart will present Celebrating Sisterhood, the 1973 Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Robert P. Jones to discuss his book, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future, which just made the New York Times bestseller list. Jackson native Robert P. Jones earned his BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College, his Master of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and his PhD in religion from Emory University. He is the founder and CEO of the Public, Reli Public Religion Research Institute, uh, Jones is the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award, and The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Grawemeyer Award in Religion. He writes regularly on politics, culture, and religion for the Atlantic, Time, and Religion News Service, and is frequently featured on MSNBC, CNN, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and other national media. So we had Robbie here to talk about his last book. It was a fantastic program. It happened during the pandemic when we were in a streaming only format. And so it is with great pleasure that I get to say this time, help me welcome Robbie Jones to the stage. Well, thank you. Um, I am so pleased to be here um, in Jackson. Um, I uh, grew up here. Um, he gave you the educational credentials, but I, I, I grew up here. Uh, I was born in Atlanta, but as, as they, we sometimes say about Yankees, um, I got to Jackson as fast as I could um, uh, and uh, was, uh, went to Forest Hill High School in Southwest Jackson uh, before going to um, uh, Mississippi College in, in Clinton. Uh, so I, I'm thrilled to be here uh, and to uh, address uh, folks in my home state. And uh, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of a reading and then just talk about the book a bit. But I, I do want to open with um, actually the opening of the book. It's a little story that I think helps capture um, some of the things I'm trying to do um, in, in this book. Uh, it's not a Mississippi story. It's actually a Minnesota story, uh, but it is connected to the Mississippi River, um, as you will see, uh, which actually forms um, a bit of a, a kind of metaphorical and, and literal uh, backbone to the book um, as, as I'm kind of traversing uh, uh, several states um, in, in the book. So I'll start with this, this story. Um, on May 4th, 1863... The steamboat Northerner pushed up the Mississippi River from St. Louis, bound for Fort Snelling, a military outpost upriver from St. Paul, Minnesota. Just a few miles into the journey, Captain Alfred J. Woods encountered a large handmade raft adrift in the strong currents. Aboard were 76 African Americans, 40 men, 10 women, and 26 children. The leader of this determined group was Robert Hickman, who was attempting to free himself, along with his family and neighbors, from enslavement on a plantation in Boone County, Missouri. Hickman, a preacher who could both read and write, had seen newspaper accounts of President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation four months earlier. Although the proclamation did not apply to Missouri because it was under Union control, this news nonetheless inspired him to begin plans to escape north. The Hickman party aimed to reach free soil by way of the river, which was by then safely patrolled by the Union Army. They embarked under cover of darkness on a moonless night of May 3rd. 
But because their makeshift craft was not equipped with sails or oars, they drifted for a day in the wrong direction before encountering the northerner. Seeing the floundering party with so many children aboard, Captain Woods asked if they needed assistance. Sympathetic to their plight and knowing that the strains of the Civil War had left Minnesota with a labor shortage, Woods ordered the raft to be securely tied to the steamboat and offered to take them as far as his final destination. Neither Woods nor Hickman anticipated the vitriol that awaited them. On May 5th, the northerner approached the levee in Lower Town on the outskirts of St. Paul. As local dock workers, mostly Irish, caught sight of the self-emancipated African Americans, commonly referred to as contraband by whites, on the trailing raft, they became increasingly agitated, seeing them as competition for jobs. As word spread, a threatening crowd gathered on the levee. The commotion was so great that St. Paul police arrived on the scene, but after assessing the situation, they sided with the mob and threatened to address not the Irish rabble-rousers, but the black asylum seekers, should they disembark. Captain Woods ordered the boat with his trailing raft to steam on to Fort Snelling. There, Hickman and his party came ashore without incident on May 5th. But they were met with an unexpected sight. Hundreds of disheveled Native Americans were huddled together, forcibly assembled near the docks. The desperate and anxious crowd they encountered were part of an original group numbering more than 1,600, mostly women, children, and el elderly Dakota people, who had been held under guard all winter, following the Dakota War of the year before, in a miserable encampment in a lowland area below Fort Snelling. Unbeknownst to them, Minnesota government officials and military leaders were awaiting the spring thaw that would allow for their mass deportation downriver from their ancestral homelands to a bleak reservation in the Nebraska Territory. By the time the ice finally melted, the river levels rose, hundreds had died. A group of 770 Dakota people had been shipped off the day before on another steamer, the Davenport. Having set the Hickman party safely ashore and unloaded the wagons and supplies for uh, the military fort, Captain Woods ordered preparations to receive his next cargo. 547 Dakota people, whom he was transporting for the fee of $25 a head plus 10 cents a day for sustenance. Soldiers from Fort Snelling herded the ragtag remnant aboard the northerner like so many cattle, as one observer put it. As they pulled away, a local minister's wife remarked, May God have mercy on them, for they can expect none from man. Neither Hickman nor his companions, nor the Dakota people, would have had the perspective to realize they were witnessing the momentous final chapter of both chattel slavery in the U.S. and Indian removal in Minnesota. They would not have grasped the, the paradox the two groups represented that afternoon on the banks of the Mississippi River, that the end of bondage for Hickman's band also marked the last vestige of sovereignty for the Dakota people. And they certainly, would not have, they certainly would have been unaware of that in the closing weeks of 1862, just five months earlier, President Lincoln was simultaneously considering two documents that would dramatically change the fates of each group. A warrant for the mass execution of 38 Dakota men and the Emancipation Proclamation. This encounter on May 5th, 1863, contains multiple narrative streams, each of which tells a different story about America. The question is, which do we follow? Do we tell the story of Fort Snelling, the military outpost established to protect the westward expansion of settler colonialism? Do we embark back down the Mississippi River to Missouri and the story of enslaved Africans in the South? Do we push upriver from St. Paul and its headwaters uh, uh, upriver from St. Paul to its headwaters and the stories of indigenous peoples populating this land for millennia? Or do we portage east and cross the larger waters connected to the homelands of Europeans who first set foot on these shores just a few hundred years ago? Each narrative pushes back to a different beginning. So one of the things um, I'm trying to do in the book uh, is to really think about this question that is roiling our country. That is, who are we as a country? And who is this country for? Right? And connected to that story are different origin stories. 
right? Um, my, my son just uh, came home uh, from middle school um, where we live in, in, in uh, D.C. and has his eighth grade uh, hi American history textbook with him. And it's one of the few textbooks they have these days. So I was pleased to see it come home as an actual textbook um, on, 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 the, on the table. But on the cover of it um, is this image. And the image is this painting uh, entitled The Spirit of 1776. Right? Some of you may have seen it, but it's basically these white dudes one with a fife, one with a drum, right? they're marching, right? And they got a bandaged head, they've been in a battle. Like, and, and that's the image on the front of the textbook. And so if that's the image, right, of America, we have a certain kind of way we begin the story, right? With these European white men uh, who are brave patriots, right? Fighting in a war of independence. Um, we've recently gotten uh, in our uh, society another um, origin story, a strong challenge, in fact, to that image, right? The 1619 Project um, over the last few years uh, and huge backlash, um, right, to that. No, it's not 1619, it's 1776, but what is the difference and why did it matter so much to so many people, right? Well, because if you have that image, that there's one beginning story, but what's the image, if you're going to put an image on the front of that, and if you remember the New York Times uh, issue where, that, where the 1619 Project first broke, um, it's an image of an ocean with a ship, right? A single ship um, on it. And on that ship are uh, people who are there against their will, African people there against their will, indentured servants uh, destined uh, to be enslaved people in colonial Virginia. So that's a different kind of beginning to our story. And if we begin there... We've got to account for the, that little image, and we've got to incorporate it somehow into the bigger narrative um, of the story. Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm doing in the book is I, I'm wanting to say like a kind of yes and to that expansive view of, of American history. And, and, and the, other, the other image I think we sometimes have, um, I used to collect postage stamps as a kid, um, and there was that one that's ubiquitous everywhere of uh, the other one with all, only white dudes in it um, is that uh, 1776 Philadelphia uh, portrait where they're all there in their colonial finery with their quill pens and they're all kind of around a table so you can see all of their faces. They're kind of, you know, very uh, um, unnaturally arranged um, around that table. But um, so if we kind of continue to open up the aperture, right, um, what I'm, one of the things I suggest in the book is that we, we really have to keep opening it up, yes, to 1619, but we actually have to take a step further back uh, because by 1619, the story of indigenous people in contact with European Americans is more than a century old already. Right, so to get that into the frame, uh, we've got to back up, and I'm arguing we have to back it up um, at least to 1493. Uh, right, so yes, I know everybody's going to two, uh, not, not the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, as we all kind of learned this little rhyme, right, in, in elementary school, but actually 1493, because something quite significant happens in 1493, and that is that Columbus goes back, right, and says, hey, you know, like, he doesn't actually know where he is or where he was, um, but he's like, back, I found these kind of undiscovered lands and peoples, um, and he's going back, and what does he ask for? He asks for uh, more supplies to go to return, right? So he wants more ships, more soldiers, more missionaries, uh, and he wants a, a, a broader mandate. Uh, and he wants kind of two kinds of mandates uh, and kind of uh, authority uh, to go back. He wants a political authority, so he needs that from uh, the Spanish king and queen, uh, which he gets. But the one that's often been overlooked, and just I think that I'm, I'm trying to kind of hold uh, front and center here, is that he actually needs a moral and religious authority uh, for what he is up to and, uh, and about to embark on. Uh, and so who does he look to uh, to get this authority? He looks to, uh, at that time, the, he the, the Western Christian church was... Uh, united um, uh, uh, under there were only there were kind of two varieties of Christians in the in the 15th uh, century um, there was only the Eastern Orthodox they'd split East and West but in the West there was the Pope in Rome and the entire Western uh, Church was organized under the Pope in Rome so that's who he appeals to um, um, so unless any of you Protestants in here start we're getting ready to wag your fingers. Um, this is before the Protestant Catholic split, right? It's before the split with the Church of England um, uh, and the Catholic Church. So all of Western Europe is kind of under the kind of Catholic uh, umbrella uh, at this moment. Uh, so he, he looks at the Pope in Rome, and, and there had been actually building over the 15th century these appeals. Columbus is actually not the first. The first uh, comes in 15, uh, 1452. And so this one that Columbus appeals to is building on a theological case for how Western Christian European nations 
are to deal with the rest of the world and what Christianity has to say as a moral mandate uh, for that. And, and over time, the way these documents that became known as the doctrine of discovery, uh, um, and this was something, Frank, so I've got a PhD in religion, uh, studied a lot of religious history. I think I might have heard that term somewhere along the way, but I definitely did not peg it as something to pay attention to. Um, and, and, and sort of in, in the book, I, I talk about it as um, I've come to see it as a kind of Rosetta Stone for decoding the way that the moral compass of Europeans was set um, as they were setting their actual compasses, right, to come here and land um, on, on these shores in mass. Uh, but the logic of it that comes to be built up over um, between 1452 and 1493 is basically this. Um, through a lot of kind of, you know, flowery theological language um, uh, and very sophisticated uh, theology, but it boils down to this. If you encounter people in other lands who are not Christian, and that is the key, if they are not Christian, that is the primary designation about whether they have human rights or not. Uh, if they are not Christian, you have the right uh, in the name of the king and the church uh, to go in and to occupy their land, steal their goods, uh, and then there are the, and, and uh, kill them if need be, do it by force. Uh, and then there are these words written into these documents uh, from the hand of the, of the Pope, uh, the leader of the Western Christian Church, uh, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Right, so that is in the documents, right, um, that, that are there. Uh, if you want to go look at them, like they, there's a, um, actually a, um, a website called doctrineofdiscovery.org, and they're there in their original Latin, they're there in English. Uh, you can actually see them. They're really quite astonishing. But Columbus actually returns then uh, to the New World, not only armed with ships, uh, soldiers, and missionaries, uh, but with this divine moral mandate. Right? Um, and it's really based on this idea of the superiority of European civilization and Christianity. Like that is the key uh, to the entire thing that sets it all um, in, in motion. So I, I, I talk about that at the beginning of the book. And one of the things I think it helps us do um, is to think about some of the conundrums, the visceral kind of arguments we're having today. Um, we could still see the roots of them or the seeds of them in this conflict and in this kind of religion that, that, um, that enters the world. So, you know, today we're still having a debate over, again, back to this, this question, like, are we um, uh, a divinely ordained promised land for European Christians? Is that who America is? Is that who America is for? Or are we a pluralistic democracy where everyone, regardless of race, regardless of religion, stands on equal footing uh, uh, before the law? And we see this, in, in the book I kind of trace it out, you can see this um, haunting us and following us all through our history. Um, the Declaration of Independence, right, which we think of, and, and rightly so, is having these beautiful principles, right, of uh, inalienable rights and, and uh, all of that. But the, that same document um, refers to uh, the original uh, uh, inhabitants of this land as merciless savages, right? Uh, so it has that kind of still that idea of kind of Christian uh, uh, and, and European uh, superiority built into it. Um, and one of the complaints between the colonists um, uh, uh, to the British crown are actually that he is uh, uh, alleging that he is um, uh, supporting uh, slave rebellions, right? That's a complaint um, about the colonists. And, and also one of the points of contention was the colonists wanted to expand um, westward and the crown, the British crown, was like, no, 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 we've, we've drawn up separate agreements with the Native Americans and we're reserving our rights to those lands. You can't have them. So there, that was kind of part of, it's built into even that document. Um, it's built into the Constitution um, in, 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 in ways there as well. It gets incorporated into U.S. law. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a case called Johnson v. McIntosh in the early uh, 1800s um, that explicitly draws on this doctrine of discovery logic uh, and just lays it out there and just says it, it, it says the superior genius of Europe, right, and the superiority of Christian, Christian religion uh, were reason enough to deny land rights to indigenous people um, here um, in the country. So it, it stays with us all the way through. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is, is to um, have this big arc, but then um, uh, I'm also looking to ways that this plays out on the ground. Um, in the book. And so I have three chapters. I went to three different places in the country, three chapters on each. Um, one of them you will be interested to know is the Mississippi Delta. Um, so I spent some time uh, uh, up there hanging out with the folks uh, that have been working on uh, developing uh, the uh, uh, Emmett Till uh, Memorial uh, work uh, in Tallahatchie County. 
uh, and, and in neighboring counties um, in the Delta, uh, which, by the way, uh, most of you have seen it, but, you know, it's just, I was just at the, um, the reception at the Department of Interior um, after the signing uh, of the, um, the proclamation that there's going to be a new national monument, uh, the Emmett Till and maybe Till Mobley uh, National Monument that will be under the auspices of the National Park. Uh, uh, National Park Service. So that's the result of 20 years of work, a little more than that actually, uh, by local local citizens in Tallahatchie County uh, deciding to tell that story. But I guess the, the sort of guiding light of the book is, you know, um, I think sometimes we hear stories like the Emmett Till story, you know, the reaction is often it's so awful. And you hear um, uh, adjectives like unimaginable, incomprehensible, right, that that kind of violence could be wielded. Right? And uh, one of the things that I think telling this longer story about this deep struggle uh, that we've had with divinely ordained racial violence uh, in this country is that those kinds of stories become less mysterious. Right? We start to understand, oh, well, we've got this root uh, that, that comes with us here. And so in, in the story, the, uh, I start the, the, uh, the chapters on, on Mississippi um, and try to weave together the story of indigenous people and the story of enslaved Africans in each place, right? So um, uh, there's a line at the beginning of, of the book, on uh, the chapter on Mississippi, where I say, you know, Emmett Till was born in 1941, uh, but his story begins 400 years earlier with the arrival of Hernando de Soto in 1541, right? And to really understand that trajectory, we've got to understand what happens there. I'm going to stay with that one for just a moment because it's a Mississippi story, um, but uh, in the Capitol Rotunda today in, in Washington, D.C., there are four gigantic 8 by 12 foot paintings around the rotunda and the upper part uh, there. If you've been there, you, you've seen them. Uh, and they are there because they explain key pivotal moments in the development of the nation. Right? One of those moments is the arrival uh, in 1541 of Hernando de Soto at the Mississippi. Right? And this painting is quite extraordinary. I describe it in the book. Um, and you could look it up uh, uh, in the, uh, online if you want to take a look at it, but I'll, I'll give you a brief description because it encapsulates uh, this, and we're still holding it up as a key moment right, in our historical development of the country. Uh, but what it depicts is, uh, you know, if you just glance at it, the first thing you see is, of course, DeSoto. Right? He's on a magnificent white horse uh, in his like, uh, you know, European finery, clearly not what he was wearing to tromp around the wilderness um, at, at that time, but, uh, but he has his European finery on. He's in the center. He's well lit in the painting. Uh, and behind him um, it, it is um, a, a Native American village uh, with, you know, half-dressed indigenous people who are all sort of, you know, cowering in awe, right, of this guy um, on this horse. Some women are kind of hugging each other and kind of hiding behind the teepee. And even the kind of um, the tribal leaders there um, are, you know, kind of looking like this uh, uh, toward him. And then if you follow the, the image then around to the left of the painting um, are all of his men kind of stuffed into the painting here. And they're all uh, girded for battle. All right, they are carrying weapons, lances, swords, pushing a cannon down in the bottom corner. And the painters painted them um, uh, as if they'd been in a fight. They, they're wounded, they're bandaged up uh, here. And, and down across the bottom, there are weapons that just spill out across the bottom of, of the, um, that are just kind of loose on the ground across the bottom. And if you fall it to the right, um, sweeping up the right hand, the bottom right hand side um, of this part of the painting um, is uh, three or four men uh, there who are pushing up this 20-foot crucifix, right, um, in the other corner of the painting. Uh, and in, in one, of, one of them reading, uh, you know, uh, it's a little priest at the bottom reading um, a religious proclamation as they're pushing this up in the village, right, right there um, in, in the middle of the village. And I think we've all seen those kind of paintings before. You've seen the people planting their flag and planting the, the crucifix. But I think when we kind of read this in the, um, the light of the Doctrine of Discovery, what we realize is that those were not, you know, I, I think I always thought when I saw those paintings, okay, these guys are like giving thanks to God for a safe voyage or, you know, something like that. They're having a little worship service there to kind of be thankful. But they are making a legal claim to the land by erecting that cross. Like that's part of the ritual of international law at the time directed by the, by the doctrine of discovery. Uh, so this is a, 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 it's a ritual enactment of a legal claim. Uh, that, that they are making. And again, based on this idea of the superiority of Christianity, the superiority of European uh, uh, civilization. And that is in our capital. Uh, it's one of four, only four paintings telling the story of who we are 
um, you know, in the U.S. Capitol uh, today. So it's still with us in so many ways. Uh, the other words that we'll often hear, right, that, that I'm, I'm sure my, my son will be writing essays on what this means, manifest destiny, right, a new Zion, right, borrowing Christian language, uh, right, um, even a city set on a hill, uh, right, from Winthrop. Um, uh, uh, you know, comes from uh, Winthrop was no pal to the indigenous people um, around him, uh, right? Um, uh, and this sitting on set on a hill was not a benign example or beacon, right? I mean, it, it was a, a fort, right? And it was a, a place from which violence came uh, to those uh, to the, to those around him. So, in the in the book, I, I tell the story of Emmett Till, and behind that, the story of the Trail of Tears, right? And and really understanding that, and what I think happens is when you do that is the way I put it uh, is that we begin to see a common thread behind those things. I always learn, um, well, first of all, I should say, I learned almost nothing about uh, indigenous history uh, uh, in, my, in my classwork uh, anywhere through a PhD program, a public school here, uh, just virtually nothing um, uh, there. And, but even when we do learn, I think that, I think most of us kind of, uh, particularly if you look like me, have a background like me, there is kind of African-American history over here. Um, we can name a few people. Um, you can name probably Martin Luther King. That may be about it. Um, and there are um, uh, almost nothing, right? Just a, arrowheads, right? Uh, something like that. Or, you know, there are, there's, it's archaeology, um, but there's nothing about the living history of indigenous people that, that, we, ever, uh, that we ever learned uh, there. I, sh- I should also say this, like even, even you know, African-American history, and I was uh, in uh, public school in the 80s, so we were starting to celebrate uh, Martin Luther King Day um, here, but it was still, you know, in this state, celebrated along with Robert E. Lee Day, Robert E. Lee's birthday. Um, and uh, when I graduated from, from Forest Hill, I graduated at the top of my class. If you had asked me who Megger Evers was, I could not have told you. And Megger Evers was gunned down nine miles from my driveway growing up, right? And who was he gunned down? He was gunned down by an Episcopalian, right? Um, a, a white Episcopalian uh, from the Delta, uh, who was a member in good standing at Church of the Nativity um, in the Delta, uh, and who had written multiple op-eds uh, to Cleveland papers and other places uh, saying that if any African-American came to his church, he'd be waiting there with a gun. And what was Meg Evers doing? I think it's part of the story always gets lost. What was he doing right before he was killed? He was trying to integrate First Baptist Church and Galloway Memorial Methodist Church. That was the work that he was doing. Um, and that's what cost him his life, ultimately, right? Um, so it's the stories are like very, very near um, uh, to us. I knew almost nothing about the Trail of Tears, um, uh, and I went to Mississippi College, right? My friend Stevens here, uh, who's still on faculty there, um, and uh, who pl- we played soccer, uh, go Choctaws, right? Um, but despite the name, uh, and it was on our jerseys and stuff, um, I knew nothing about the actual Choctaw people um, in this place. And there was a kind of little part of me that kind of wandered around the state looking, and I would see, like, man, why is everything here built up in 1840, right, or 1830-something? Um, huh, you know, the country was around a long time before that. Like, why, why here is it 1830s, 1840s? And, you know, they, well, well, it took us that long to sort of move off um, all the uh, Choctaw Creek, Chickasaw folks uh, from here. Uh, in order to kind of build all the white institutions um, here. And this linking this idea, right, that, that even in the Delta, all that fertile farmland up there, it was woods, right? It wasn't farmland, it was woods, like really impenetrable uh, woods. And so what had to happen was first a removal of the indigenous people and then the importation of African enslaved labor to clear that land, right? So it's kind of a... But if we kind of see these two things in focus, I think it takes us, you know, in many, um, I'll kind of put it this way, many, I think, even uh, kind of more liberal, kind of do-gooder white people, um, you know, uh, in the early part of the 20th century would talk about, um, yeah, you know, we've got, to, we've got to address the Negro problem. We have to address the Indian problem, right? That was the language uh, that was being used. And, you know, but when we tell these stories, I think in more like stereoscopic vision, we can see these two narratives together um, one of the things I'm arguing is that, like, look, if we, if we are honest about it, what we'll see is that sort of if we push past the quote-unquote Negro problem and we push past the quote-unquote Indian problem, what we see upstream from that is a white Christian problem, right? That we are still 
wrestling with. And we're still denying, I think, in many ways, that, that history. Um, and, and so I think part of what I'm trying to do is in, in every place I'm looking at, uh, and every, I could have, I could run 50, 50, ch- every state, right, um, could tell these stories um, here. And, and so I, I, I went to Mississippi, to Oklahoma, uh, to uh, talk to the folks that were working on the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, Memorial and, com- and uh, commemorative work uh, there that happened in 1921, uh, based on uh, one of the worst acts, maybe the worst act of, of mass racial violence um, that happened uh, in 1921, where 300, uh, and maybe upward of that, that's a kind of probably a conservative estimate, African Americans were killed over a couple of days by roving bands of their white neighbors, uh, right? Um, uh, uh, then I went to Duluth, Minnesota, because uh, I, I wanted to not just pick on the South and not just pick on a very conservative state. Um, I, I think Oklahoma may be the, uh, uh, the, the reddest state, and I think it's the, the only state that the, every county voted for President Trump um, in, the, in the last um, election in Oklahoma. Uh, but I wanted to kind of go up north, right? Uh, because what it, what it became so clear to me is that this is not this is not a southern story, right? It's not a sort of like western frontier story. It is an American story, right? So in Duluth, Minnesota, just a quick note there, and then we can um, maybe move some questions in a minute. Um, uh, there was a, a lynching uh, in Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth touches the Great Lakes. I mean, it is right up there by Canada. Um, uh, very white, very few African Americans uh, uh, lived there uh, at the time or, or even today. Uh, and there were three African American men who were, in, who were um, in town for a single day. They were there working on a traveling circus that went through town. It was there for a single day. They were falsely accused by a white woman of sexually assaulting her. Uh, right, the formula right, uh, for, for lynching uh, in this country. Uh, and they were taken to jail. And in Duluth, Minnesota, 10,000 people, a mob of 10,000 people pulled them from the jail uh, and lynched them on the town square, right? And that was a tenth of the population of the town um, at the time, right? So it was only about 100,000 people uh, there. And then, and then promptly, uh, like, no one was brought to justice. The town's just like, we're not going to talk about this um, I- anymore. They were buried in unmarked graves, uh, like, just kind of covered up, hush it up. Uh, and about uh, in, in the 90s, uh, there was a group of three people that decided, like, we really are going to have to tell the truth about this, um, and we're, and we're going to have to kind of bring it to light. If we're ever going to have a more honest place to stand for, to build a better future together, we have to tell the truth uh, about this and, and begin work, doing the work there. So what the book is doing is kind of looking at these efforts of truth-telling, confession, reconciliation, repair, uh, I think for models, because we, we need some models uh, for this. And, and, um, and, and so Mississippi, uh, Minnesota, um, and Oklahoma are kind of places um, that, that, I, that I'm going to kind of look at this. Uh, uh, because we're here at a history museum, I want to end um, with one more reading uh, here that, that goes to a particular problem um, that I, I know uh, Mississippi, like many other states, um, has this in this struggle with things like uh, banning books, um, things like uh, not teaching parts of our history, all right, because it's going to make some people who look like me feel uncomfortable. Uh, right? Um, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we deal with that? Um, how do we uh, wrestle with that? And, and one of the things I'm, I'm calling for in the book, uh, I think for, particularly for people who are white and Christian, uh, because we have been at the heart of the problem, all right, um, is to uh, step up and think about it differently. And one of the ways that I've, I've tried to do that is I tried to kind of channel what it is I think we white Christians are really saying when we're trying to deny that history. Like, what are we really saying? Uh, there, because I think if we say it out loud, it becomes harder to defend, right? Um, so I'm going to kind of give you my best example, my best uh, attempt here uh, that I kind of write in the last chapter of kind of what I think we, we white Christians are really saying. It's in a section of the book that's toward the end um, called Confession and Call, a word to my fellow white Christians. Um, so I'll kind of wrap uh, with that. Um, uh, so the following is, is my attempt to give voice to the half-conscious narrative I inherited and relied upon for far too many years to dispel the ghosts of other American histories haunting the edges of my awareness. I believe it's not too far off the mark from the history many contemporary white Christians are demanding at this moment, or at least the history we actually want to claim, if we cannot bring ourselves to assert it as straightforwardly as our forebears. We would like to hold these truths Self-evident. No responsibility for the actions of our ancestors, nor for the effects of their actions on the present. That hard work and individual merit are the keys to understanding both the path to the present and the possibilities of the future. 
The haves and the have-nots of today receive what they deserve based on the virtues of their individual past actions. It follows that no one, particularly hardworking white Christian people, should be made to feel uncomfortable because of what we now have. If anyone asserts otherwise, we are the ones being discriminated against. This land is our land, from California to the New York Island. We deserve to keep everything we've worked so hard to take. <laughs> we have deeds and safe deposit boxes with our names on them, the veracity of which are guaranteed by a notary seal and a state we created for this purpose. As for the vast amount of wealth locked away in individual trusts and institutional endowments, we have histories that document our industriousness to our now long and, 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 to our, and testify to our now long held legal ownership. Furthermore, what we have done, we have done with the ultimate authority. Jesus is one of us. In case there was any doubt, we made a likeness of Jesus in our image, the most widely distributed portrait in human history. We insist, both for ourselves and for others, on an inevitable present, one in which what was leads to what is, and what is will always be. It is not that we're against history. Now, we know the importance of a good origin story. History done rightly explains how we got here. With our fences transforming land into property, our ledgers turning labor and crops into capital, and our hands holding the receipts. The history of America, founded in 1776, is a Genesis story justifying the divinely ordained now not a sloppy mess of narratives with multiple beginnings and contingent outcomes. Those who looked like us owned the publishing companies who hired our writers to tell the story of how we became to be America. Those executives also had the right connections to sell those packaged narratives to our public school boards, who handed books and lesson plans to our teachers, who in turn faithfully taught those stories to our children, and the circle remained unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. We know that slavery was a blemish, on this country's record, and that this was mostly the cause of the Civil War. Still, there were good and noble people on both sides. Even though slavery wasn't always as brutal as Hollywood depicts it, we're glad that sinful practice has ended and that the whole unfortunate affair is now behind us. What we didn't get right after the Civil War was finally rectified by the good Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., whose eloquent words we now read in our churches and whose birthday we celebrate alongside Robert E. Lee's. On the occasion when we think about it, we also feel bad about what happened to the Indians. But we also share Laura Engel Wilder's sentiments about the land in the early days of the country. Quote, There were no people there. Only Indians lived there. End quote. In any case, we weren't personally a part of all that. And it was, after all, our missionaries who brought the Indians with their primitive and savage ways out of the darkness and into the light of Christian salvation. It was our government and our churches that coaxed those lost children out of the woods and into boarding schools, saving their souls and disciplining their bodies for more industrious pursuits like farming and factory work. We still honor their history with our athletic team names, mascots, and more recently, with the occasional land acknowledgement at ritual at public events. We did finally give the Indians reservations of their own. They seem to be doing fine now with their casinos and government-provided health care. Finally, though of course there have been times when some Christians acted badly, they were acting against and not with the spirit of our faith. No true Christian would kill or steal or lie. This is the history we want our tax dollars to teach public school children. And many of our children are already getting this history in private Christian academies. We want our children to know that America is good, just like us. So I'm going to read just kind of one more little passage here at the very end. Um, it's kind of my little benediction. We white Christians no longer represent the majority of Americans. We are no longer capable of setting the nation's course by sheer cultural and political dominance. But there are still more than enough of us to decisively derail the future of democracy in America. If we wish to do otherwise, we could no longer disingenuously pretend that democracy and the doctrine of discovery are or ever were compatible. 
We can no longer pay tribute to one while benefiting from the other. We must choose. And if we choose democracy, it will will require more than just confession by an unflinching few. It will require joining the work already underway to repair the damage done by this malignant cultural legacy. Through that transformative engagement, we might finally illuminate the path that leads to a shared American future. Stop there. All right. So I think we've got, yes, a microphone over here, uh, which we'll need to use because I think we've got folks joining us um, online. When we consider what happened here in Mississippi in the summer of 1964, would it be appropriate to use the term Christian terrorist? Hmm. Yeah, I've used that term before. Um, you know, so I mentioned um, Byron Dale Beckwith, right? Um, Episcopalian, right? People didn't write about him that way, right? And in fact, um, uh, Eudora Welty, some may remember, wrote a piece uh, right after this happened before they knew who did it in a piece called uh, uh, Where's the Voice Coming From, right? I think is the name of the piece. And she put the gun in the hand of a redneck, right? Not somebody from the planter class at an Episcopal church in the Delta, right? And so I think we, we just haven't really kind of, you know, come to terms with, uh, with this. Um, and clearly, Dylan Roof, right, uh, who gunned down nine African-American worshipers at Mother Emanuel AME uh, Church in Charleston. Um, who was he? He was a confirmed ELCA Lutheran, right, who grew up in the church. In fact, if you look at his um, uh, journals that he had uh, uh, while he was awaiting trial, um, he was writing not only a kind of racist screed about how Christianity needed to step up and be a warrior's religion, right, and was wanting to start a kind of race war based on Christianity and, and uh, that, that vision of Christianity. But he was drawing, if you look, at, you, it's online, you can look because it was entered into evidence. Uh, but if you flip through it, um, uh, uh, you can see he was doodling crosses, religious symbols, all through the journal. And he has a full page, um, uh, one of the, the few full page ones, um, is a uh, white Jesus emerging from the tomb uh, that he sketched out in, the, in these journals. Right? Clearly a part, he had his, a little personal logo uh, that, he, that he drew like to represent himself. And it has all kinds of white supremacist symbols uh, around it. But at the center um, is a cross, right? He saw it very central to his. So, I, yeah, I, I think um, uh, here's the thing. We, so my day job, I do, uh, you know, uh, I sometimes get called a pollster in D.C. circles, but I do public opinion research. Uh, we actually did a survey where we asked people, uh, we asked a, a kind of a random sample of Americans, um, if someone commits an act of violence in the name of Islam, are they really Muslim, really and truly Muslim? And then we, we split the sample. We asked half the sample that question. We asked half the sample, if someone commits, you see where this is going, right, uh, uh, violence in the name of Christianity, are they really and truly Christian? And lo and behold, not surprisingly, but there's a huge double standard in America. People are more than willing to say, yeah, that guy's really Muslim, right, but not willing to say that guy's really Christian. He's just crazy, Right. Um, and, and so I, I think we've got to be comfortable with this, right? The, the, the FBI, the, the Homeland Security um, now, you know, is, is naming kind of white supremacist uh, uh, domestic terrorism as a bigger threat uh, than foreign terrorism on U.S. soil. And many of those folks are wrapped up, right, with a version of white supremacy that has, it's always been ethno-religious in this country, right? So, in, you know, the KKK, right, was not a secular movement. Um, The reason why the KKK was like opposed to Catholics and Jews is because they weren't Protestant, Christian, right? So their vision was white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant America. Like that's the vision. It's always been. And and the reason why is is because of the doctrine of discovery, right? It is this vision of a divinely ordained promised land for European Christians uh, that is um, still circulating in the bloodstream uh, for us. And I think we've got to be willing to call that, call that out. And, you know, when you have someone committing violence in the name of Jesus, like, you could say, well, they're not really Christian, but they think they are, right? Um, and uh, we ought to take that seriously. Yeah. Um, 
First, I, I wanted to say I just started uh, listening to your book this morning, and uh, it, it's fascinating, and it crisscrosses what I'm doing with one other group uh, besides black people, indigenous people, and white people, women, mm. uh, in all sorts of ways, and all sorts of things I'd like to talk about. Uh, but I, and, and one thing I'll quickly mention, just from what you just said, uh, when we visited Dachau a couple of decades ago, there's a Russian Orthodox church there, and the painting shows Jesus leading the people out of the concentration camps. Mm. Anyway, um, but the, the question I want to ask now, are you familiar with um, uh, Graeber and Wengrow's uh, The Dawn of Everything? Um, no, I haven't read it well, yet. Well, one of the things they, I, it, it's an amazing book, but one of the things that um, they mention, which I think fits together with this idea of 1776 and what America is all about, they argue that uh, the Enlightenment and the ideas that became the basis of the American Revolution and the good side of American history actually came from indigenous North American Indians uh, pointing out that the, this whole idea of power from below was just absolutely mm. absent in Europe uh, at the time. And there, they have these Wendat people who actually visited and went to the salons there. Um, I just wondered whether you have thought about that at all. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I'll just say something quickly about that. Um, the, the, um, the arrows that the eagle is clutching on our seal, right, is, has indigenous roots, right? It has this, this, this idea that if you have uh, one, you can break it, right? But if they're bound together, uh, you can't break it, right? And there's kind of strength in numbers, but I mean, this, this kind of, it's a federalism idea, basically, right? Kind of local, more kind of local, but we're coming together. Um, it's clear that Benjamin Franklin uh, had contact with indigenous people and kind of got some ideas about governance from, from some of those encounters as well. Yeah. Hi. First, uh, what year did you finish at Forest Hill? 86. Okay. Um, I live in the South Jackson. Yep. Uh, but anyway, my question is, you know, I was listening as you read the last part, and at first I didn't realize it was sort of a, you know, a tongue-in-cheek or mm. maybe a satirical piece. Um, I actually believed it was from what a particular governor wrote in his state's curriculum as to how not to hurt people's feelings. It, it seems to echo. Uh, and, and do you see that what DeSantis is doing sort of echoes in a way what you said? So uh, I'm trying to channel that a little bit um, uh, and, and make it more explicit, right? Because it's often a little bit coded uh, here. But I think what I was trying to do there is to say, if we were really saying out loud all the things that are kind of buried in every invocation of critical race theory, um, this is what it would sound like, right? And I think it becomes a little, a lot less defensible if we kind of say all of it out loud, right? Because then the, I mean, it's an audacious claim, right? When you think about this, it's an audacious anti-democratic claim to say that this country was intended by God for a way European Christian. That's who we are and that's who the country's for. That is a fundamentally anti-democratic thing to say, right? Um, and we've got to, got to be clear about that, right? We've been kind of haunted by this uh, uh, for all of our country's history. And we keep, we've kicked this can down the road. We've never really fully said no, right? That's not who we are and who this country is for. Um, uh, and, you know, we're, we're here. Um, I, so I, I have a little section on Governor Reeves in the book. Um, you'll be happy to know. Um, uh, and, and, and with a very similar argument, right, in, in all, along these lines. Of, of, uh, and, you know, the, the, um, one thing about this discomfort thing, I appreciate the question, um, is I, I wrote a piece, um, I don't know, when this all first hit the fan, uh, uh, called The Sacred Gift of White Discomfort. Um, right, and, and here's the thing, like, so I grew up Southern Baptist, right, uh, in Southwest Jackson, Woodville Heights Baptist Church, that's where I grew up, and there was nothing in my theological background of a seminary degree, nowhere did I ever get the sense that Christianity was supposed to be comfortable, right? I don't know where that came from, uh, right, um, and in fact, in, in our tradition, I mean, I, I've been to, like, tent revivals in fields, you know, and in that revivalist tradition, there was this thing down in front called the mourner's bench, Right, and people would come when they were under conviction by God, by the Holy Spirit, and they would come down front, and they would sit, and most of them they would be weeping, wailing, sometimes rolling around on the ground. They were in such agony, right? And that tradition, I mean, that is extreme discomfort, right? But it was because of something they were convicted they needed to change about themselves, and they didn't want to. They're holding on to it. They're struggling, right? Is this wrestling? 
Uh, and, and that tradition, I think, is we've got to recapture that here, right? And there's no doubt, right? It's going to be hard to look in the mirror um, and, and kind of take this in. Um, you know, my, my, uh, my grandfather uh, was uh, a deacon at, at Eastside uh, Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. Uh, one of his jobs as a deacon in 1963 uh, was to stand on the steps of the church and make sure no black people entered the sanctuary. Like, that was an official role for the deacon uh, to, to do that, Right. Uh, and somebody who I love dearly, right? I have in my, my family's Bible, um, I have a family Bible from 1815. It goes all the way back to middle Georgia. Uh, and I also have uh, estate settlements from that same family that owned that Bible, that ha- took care of it, handed it down, preachers in our family, all that stuff, uh, an estate settlement with enslaved people on it, right, uh, uh, from, from middle Georgia. Uh, so I, it's going to take some, th- there's going to be some discomfort, right, dealing with it. I think we can handle it. Um, right, um, and and I think uh, the the country depends on us doing that, uh, right? Because there's no way to I think get an honest uh, foundation that we can all stand on together uh, and go somewhere uh, together if we don't do that. Yeah. One of the things I learned when I started doing uh, research on my family uh, tree was that my great-great-granddaddy was in the group that started Southern Baptist Convention, Mm. 1847. Mm. And that one of their main doctrines was the superiority of the white race. Before they separated from the National Baptist, which included black congregations, uh, they, you know... We're getting along a lot better. But then they had a group of them that decided, no, we don't need to do this. We need to have our separate uh, denomination. And so they started Southern Baptist. And it hasn't been that long ago. And my dad, uh, I grew up with a Baptist preacher, Southern Baptist Mm -hmm. preacher, who got into a big row with his deacons about civil rights and how they were supposed to be civil and Mm. Christian about integration and so on and so forth. No, they weren't going to have it. And uh, so he he, uh, resigned and started teaching school and helped part of the Tupelo school system integrate without uh, a big racial divide. But anyway, uh, the um, I was embarrassed about the history you know, that they were so racial, and uh, it uh, it sent me to the Episcopal Church, so. <laughs> and yeah. now, now we have a black bishop. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, I, I appreciate that. I, I hope I, this doesn't dash it too much, but uh, I'm speaking at St. Philip's Episcopal tonight um, uh, on Old Canton Road uh, tonight, uh, but, you know, so I grew up Baptist, and it's worth noting, right, that, yes, that uh, the Methodists split the same in, in that same time period. Um, in fact, every Protestant denomination splits north and south um, uh, over, over the issue of slavery before the Civil War. And there's, a mar- there's an argument to be made that the white Christians' splits were the dress rehearsal for the Civil War, right? Uh, it, there were Christian splits before there were political splits, right? And many of those Christian leaders were in the rooms for the secessionists. Uh, conventions, right? So it, it wasn't like a separate group of people. They were, many of them were the same uh, one, uh, but, but I can't resist, you know, let us all remember that Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee were Episcopalian. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we, none of us, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, escape. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, um, from, from a, a, an educator's point of view and and uh, l- listening to all of this considering the, the um, all, all, all of the concern of, about the the is a 1619 project and and and, and uh, the what 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 they are afraid will mm-hmm. make people uncomfortable. Um, I, 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 I want to um, want, want to emphasize that it, it affects 
more than just white people because um, all, all the people have been indoctrinated, especially the, the very r religious people. Mm. And, and it comes down to keeping people ignorant at a certain level. It, when, when I left the state, I did not realize that there were certain um, music and information that was not allowed in Mississippi mm. that I learned about in other states. Mm. So I, I, I just uh, think that it's very important that the other side of this is keeping people ignorant. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, with a very clear interest in mind, right, to preserve the status quo, right, and to keep us from questioning. Uh, and and the thing, here's the thing, we, we just can't even understand the world we live in without understanding this history, right? I mean, you can't understand wealth inequality in this country without understanding this history. You can't understand any of the racial, like, strife or divisions we have in this country uh, without, under, without um, getting, getting any of it. So it's vitally important. The other thing I'll say about this uncomfortable thing, uh, real quickly, though, is that it's, it's always concerned with, like, white kids' discomfort, right? What's, what about, like, kids of color, right? Aren't they going to be uncomfortable if their history is not reflected in this story, if their story is not uh, told here? Uh, I think that's the other thing that always just kind of slides right by in most of those conversations. Yeah. I would, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your research and <clears throat> your point of view. But there's there's something that almost makes it sound like it's unique to America. Mm. And in the 11th and 12th centuries, the popes were preaching crusade where they moved yeah. into uh, Islamic territory in the Near East and in um, Northern Africa to fight the Muslim horde. Uh, which was not, div uh, of, it was not empty of civilization, let's put it that way. Uh, the Arabs uh, discovered algebra and uh, improved astronomy. They were highly civilized, but they were not Christian. Mm -hmm. And the, after the Crusades, there were, of course, well, even before, there's the split between the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And it was the Roman Church that, in a sense, was conducting war against the Eastern Church as well. And then if, um, if we remember 1492 and Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that was when the fall of Grenada mm. finally drove the Muslims back out of Spain. And, and to, but they were still in Sicily and and other places. So Latin Christianity has always been a very belligerent religion, very um, involved in trying to increase its boundaries. And, and it comes in large measure from the belief that, as I was taught as a young grade school in Guardian Angel Church, it was a, um, the only true religion. No other religion had any claim on contact with the Almighty. So it translates in certain ways here in the United States and the Western, Western Hemisphere. But uh, Christians have always been willing. And in fact, if they had just waited maybe another 100 years or so before discovering America, they would um, have been fighting one another as Christians, Catholics, and Protestants all over Europe and in America as well. In fact, they did in America, and for a long time, in, especially in New England, uh, if you were a Catholic, you just didn't belong yeah. because those were all states where, or prov provinces where the um, Christian Protestant religion was a part of the uh, state constitution.
Yeah, no, I appreciate that longer sentiment. And actually, I think one of the things this does of kind of bringing it uh, into a space that's before the Republic is that it actually does connect very well with that longer history. So the entire transatlantic slave trade, uh, not just here, but all across the Americas, uh, plural, um, fits into this narrative now, right? That doesn't if you just got the guys like with their fives, right? Um, on, on the, uh, that, that, you can't see that story in that, in that image. Um, uh, so I, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, you could take it back to Constantine, right? Um, you can kind of, the kind of merger of, of Christianity with Roman authority. I mean, so it's, there are roots there. What I think I was trying to do with, by landing on 1493, and I don't want to commit like my own kind of overstating of like that year, that's when America began, you know, like that kind of thing. I don't need to be that dogmatic about it. But I was trying to look for kind of approximate cause to the American story, right? And I think that's, and I think 1493 gives us that. Yeah. It, my question is kind of piggyback off that. So uh, undergraduate at Mississippi State, um, I learned um, about the papal bull Doom, Doom de Versas in uh, wow. 19, or 1453 right. yeah. that laid precursor to um, the, yeah. the, one, the papal bulls that you had said. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. So my, like, I was taught by my professors that that was with Alphonse the fifth, Alfonso the fifth, of Portugal going into North Africa yep. and getting the Pope's permission to enslave North Africans and um, Saracens and all that to um, basically take over that land because they weren't Christian mm -hmm. uh, was basically what Christopher Columbus was talking about with the Taino people and other people were like, hey, give me the same thing so I can do this in yeah. this part of the land. Okay. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. But wow. I'm, I, I got none of that, I should just say, like uh, in my own. Uh, so good, good for Mississippi State uh, for uh, putting that on the table. I apologize. We didn't get to everybody's questions. That's one of the best things and sometimes <laughs> the worst things about this series. There are usually more questions than we have time for, but we've gone a little past the top of the hour. We do have copies of Robbie's book and uh, the other book that he did for History's Lunch a few years ago, and I bet he'll be delighted to answer any questions you may have over here. Yep. Thank you all for being with yeah. us today. Uh, I hope that you come back next Wednesday for Angela Stewart, and don't forget about the gallery talk tomorrow um, here upstairs. For now, help me thank Robbie Jones for this fantastic program. Thank you.